Joe. Once you've defined a data schema for function arguments and for its return value, it's quite simple to generate a unit test for this function. Dave. How? Joe. Well, think about it. What's the essence of a unit test for a function? Dave. A unit test calls a function with some arguments and checks whether the function returns the expected value. Joe. Exactly. Now let's adapt it to the context of data schema and DOP. Let's say you have a function with a schema for their arguments and for their return value. Dave. Okay. Joe. Here's the flow of a schema-based unit test. We call the function with random arguments that conform to the schema of the function arguments. Then we check whether the function returns a value that conforms to the schema of the return value. Here, let me diagram it. Joe goes to the whiteboard. He draws the diagram in figure 12.3. Dave, how do you generate random data that conforms to a schema? Joe, using a tool like JSON Schema Faker. For example, let's start with a simple schema, the schema for a UUID. Let me show you how to generate random data that conforms to the schema. Note, you'll find more information about JSON Schema Faker at github.com slash json dash schema dash faker slash json dash schema dash faker. Joe types on the keyboard for a bit. He then shows the code to generate random data to Dave and Theo. Dave executes the code snippet a couple of times, and indeed, on each evaluation, it returns a different UUID. Dave, very cool. Let me see how it works with more complex schemas, like the catalog schema. When Dave calls JSON schema faker dot generate with the catalog schema, he gets some quite long random data. He's a bit surprised by the results. Joe, I see that you have some bugs in your regular expressions. Theo, how can you see that? Joe, some of the generated ISBNs don't seem to be valid ISBNs. Dave, you're right. I hate regular expressions. Joe, Dave, I don't think you're the only one with that sentiment. Let me show you how to implement the flow of a schema-based unit test for catalog.searchbooks by title. Dave, Wait a moment. I can't see where you check that catalog.searchbooksbyTitle returns a value that conforms to the return value schema. Theo, if you look closer at the code, you'll see it. Dave takes a closer look at the code for catalog.searchbooksbyTitle. Now he sees it. Dave, of course. It's in the code of catalog.searchbooksbyTitle. If the return value doesn't conform to the schema, it throws an exception, and the test fails. Joe, correct. Now let's improve the code of our unit test and return false when an exception occurs inside catalog.searchbooks by title. Joe edits the test code. He shows his changes to Theo and Dave. Dave, let me see what happens when I run the test. Joe, before we run it, we need to fix something in your unit test. Dave, what? Joe, the catalog data and the query are random. There's a good chance that no books will match the query. We need to create a query that matches at least one book. Dave, how are we going to find a query that's guaranteed to match at least one book? Joe, our query will be the first letter of the first book from the catalog data that is generated. Joe types for a bit and shows Theo and Dave his refined test. They are delighted that Joe is taking the time to fix their unit test. Dave, I see. It's less complicated than what I thought. Does it happen often that you need to tweak the random data? Joe, no, usually the random data is just fine. Dave, okay, now I'm curious to see what happens when I execute the unit test. When Dave executes the unit test, it fails. His expression is one of bewilderment. Theo is just astonished. Dave, I think something's wrong in the code of the unit test. Theo, maybe the unit test caught a bug in the implementation of catalog.searchbooks by title. Dave, let's check it out. Is there a way to have the unit test display the return value of the function? Joe, yes, here it is. Joe once again turns to his laptop to update the code. 
He shows the others his new unit test that includes the return value for catalog.searchbooks by title. Dave. Now, let's see what's displayed when I again run the unit test. Dave. I think I understand what happened. In our random catalog data, the authors of the books are not present in the author by IDs index. That's why we have all those undefineds in the values returned by catalog.searchbooks by title, whereas in the schema, we expect a string. Theo, how do we fix that? Dave, simple. Have catalog.author names return the string not available when an author doesn't exist in the catalog. Maybe something like this. Dave executes the unit test again. Thankfully, this time it passes. Joe, well done, Dave. Dave, you were right. The automatically generated unit tests were able to catch a bug in the implementation of catalog.searchbooks by title. Joe, don't worry. The same thing has happened to me so many times. Dave, data validation a la DOP is really cool. Joe, that's just the beginning, my friend. The more you use it, the more you love it. Dave, I must admit, I still miss one cool IDE feature from OOP. Joe, which one? Dave, the auto-completion of field names in a class. Joe, for the moment, field name auto-completion for data is only available in Clojure via CLJ-Condo and the integration it provides with Mali. Note. See github.com slash clj-condo slash clj-condo and github.com slash metosin slash mali for the autocompletion feature provided by clj-condo and its integration with mali. Dave, do you think that someday this functionality will be available in other programming languages? Joe, absolutely. IDEs like IntelliJ and Visual Studio Code already support JSON schema validation for JSON files. It's only a matter of time before they support JSON schema validation for function arguments and provide auto-completion of the field names in a map. Dave, I hope it won't take them too much time. Section 12.6. A new gift. When Joe leaves the office, Dave gets an interesting idea. He shares it with Theo. Dave, do you think we could make our own JSON schema cheat sheet with the advanced JSON schema features that we discovered today? Theo, excellent idea, but you'll have to do it on your own. I have to run to a meeting. After his meeting, Theo comes back to Dave's desk. When he sees Theo, Dave takes a small package, like the one Joe gave Theo a few weeks ago, from the top of his desk. This one, however, is wrapped in a light blue ribbon. With a solemn demeanor, Dave hands Theo the gift. When Theo undoes the ribbon, he discovers a stylish piece of paper decorated with little computers in different colors. In the center of the paper, he reads the inscription, Advanced JSON Schema Cheat Sheet. Theo smiles while browsing the JSON schema, see listing 12.30. Then he turns the paper over to find that the back is also filled with drawings, this time keyboards and mice. In the center of the paper, Theo reads the inscription, Example of Valid Data, see listing 12.31. Summary We define data schemas using a language like JSON schema for function arguments and return values. Function argument schemas allow developers to figure out the expected shape of the function arguments they want to call. When invalid data is passed, data validation third-party libraries give meaningful errors with detailed information about the data parts that are not valid. Unlike data validation at system boundaries, data validation inside the system is supposed to run only at development time and should be disabled in production. We visualize a data schema by generating a data model diagram out of a JSON schema. For functions that have data schemas for their arguments and return values, we can automatically generate schema-based unit tests. Data validation is executed at runtime. We can define advanced data validation conditions that go beyond static types, like checking whether a number is within a range or if a string matches a regular expression. Data validation inside the system should be disabled in production. 
Records are represented as heterogeneous maps, and indexes are represented as homogeneous maps. When you define a complex data schema, it is advised to store nested schemas in variables to make the schemas easier to read. We treat data validation like unit tests. Chapter 13, Polymorphism, Playing with the Animals in the Countryside. This chapter covers mimicking objects with multi-methods, single dispatch, implementing multi-method on several argument types, multiple dispatch, implementing multi-methods dynamically on several arguments, dynamic dispatch. OOP is well known for allowing different classes to be called with the same interface via a mechanism called polymorphism. It may seem that the only way to have polymorphism in a program is with objects. In fact, in this chapter, we are going to see that it is possible to have polymorphism without objects, thanks to multi-methods. Moreover, multi-methods provide a more advanced polymorphism than OOP polymorphism, because they support cases where the chosen implementation depends on several argument types, multiple dispatch, and even on the dynamic value of the arguments, dynamic dispatch. Section 13.1, The Essence of Polymorphism. For today's session, Dave has invited Theo to come and visit him at his parents' house in the countryside. As Theo's drive across the Golden Gate Bridge takes him from the freeway to increasingly rural country roads, he lets himself be carried away by the beauty of the landscape, the smell of fresh earth, and the sounds of animals in nature. This nature bath puts him in an excellent mood. What a way to start the week. Dave receives Theo in jeans and a t-shirt, a marked contrast with the elegant clothes he wears at the office. A straw hat completes his country look. Theo says hello to Dave's parents, now retired. Dave suggests that they go pick a few oranges in the field to squeeze for juice. After drinking a much more flavorful orange juice than they are used to in San Francisco, Theo and Dave get to work. Dave, when I was waiting for you this morning, I thought of another thing I missed from OOP. Theo, what's that? Dave, polymorphism. Theo, what kind of polymorphism? Dave, you know, you define an interface and different classes implement the same interface in different ways. Theo, I see. And why do you think polymorphism is valuable? Dave, because it allows us to decouple an interface from its implementations. Theo, would you mind illustrating that with a concrete example? Dave, sure, because we're in the country, I'll use the classic OOP polymorphism example with animals. Theo, good idea. Dave, let's say that each animal has its own greeting by making a sound and saying its name. Theo, oh cool, like in anthropomorphic comic books. Dave, anthro what? Theo, you know, comic books where animals can walk, speak, and so forth, like Mickey Mouse. Dave, of course, but I don't know that term. Where does it come from? Theo, anthropomorphism comes from the Greek anthropos, which means human, and morphe, which means form. Dave, I see. So an anthropomorphic book is a book where animals have human traits. The word sounds related to polymorphism. Theo, absolutely. Polymorphism comes from the Greek polis, which means many, and morphe which, again, means form. Dave, that makes sense. Polymorphism is the ability of different objects to implement the same method in different ways. That brings me back to my animal example. In OOP, I define an iAnimal interface with a greet method, and each animal class would implement greet in its own way. Here, I happen to have an example. Theo, let me challenge you a bit. What is the fundamental difference between OOP polymorphism and a switch statement? Dave, what do you mean? Theo, I could, for instance, represent an animal with a map having two fields, name and type, and call a different piece of code depending on the value of type. Theo pulls his laptop from its bag and fires it up. While the laptop is booting up, he enjoys another taste of that wonderful orange juice. When the laptop is ready, he quickly types in the example switch case. Meanwhile, Dave has finished his glass of orange juice. Dave, 
How would animal look, exactly? Heyo. Like I just said, a map with two fields, name and type. Let me input that for you. Dave, could you have given another name to the field that holds the animal type? Theo, absolutely. It could be anything. Dave, I see. You're asking me the fundamental difference between your code with a switch statement and my code with an interface and three classes. Theo, exactly. Dave, first of all, if you pass an invalid map to your greet function, bad things will happen. Theo, you're right. Let me fix that and validate input data. Note. You should not use switch statements like this in your production code. We use them here for didactic purposes, only as a step towards distilling the essence of polymorphism. Dave. Another drawback of your approach is that when you want to modify the implementation of greet for a specific animal, you have to change the code that deals with all the animals, while in my approach, you would change only a specific animal class. Theo, I agree, and I could also fix that by having a separate function for each animal, something like this. Dave, but what if you want to extend the functionality of greet and add a new animal? Theo, now you got me. I admit that with a switch statement, I can't add a new animal without modifying the original code. Whereas in OOP, I can add a new class without having to modify the original code. Dave, yeah, but you helped me to realize that the main benefit of polymorphism is that it makes the code easily extensible. Tip. The main benefit of polymorphism is extensibility. Theo, I'm going to ask Joe if there's a way to benefit from polymorphism without objects. Theo sends a message to Joe and asks him about polymorphism in DOP. Joe answers that he doesn't have time to get into a deep response because he is in a tech conference where he is about to give a talk about DOP. The only thing he has time to tell Theo is that he should take a look at multi-methods. Theo and Dave read some online material about multi-methods. It doesn't look too complicated. They decide that after lunch they will give multi-methods a try. Section 13.2, Multi-Methods with Single Dispatch. During lunch, Theo asks Dave how it feels to have grown up in the country. Dave starts with an enthusiastic description about being in direct contact with nature and living a simpler life than in the city. He's grateful for the experience, but he admits that country life can sometimes be hard without the conveniences of the city. But who said simple was easy? After lunch, they decide to have coffee. Dave asks Theo if he'd like to grind the coffee beans himself. Theo accepts with joy. Next, Dave explains how to use a French press coffee maker to get the ideal trade-off between bitterness and rich taste. While savoring their French press coffee in the garden, Theo and Dave continue their exploration of polymorphism a la DOP. Theo, from what I read before lunch, it seems that multi-methods are a software construct that provide polymorphism without the need for objects. Dave, I don't get how that's possible. Theo, multi-methods have two parts, a dispatch function and a set of methods that provide an implementation for each dispatched value. Dave, I'm not sure I'm clear on that. Is a dispatch function like an interface? Theo, it's like an interface in the sense that it defines the way the function needs to be called, but it goes beyond that. It also dispatches a value that differentiates between the different implementations. Dave, that's a bit abstract for me. Theo, I think I understand how to implement the animal greeting capabilities. If we use a multi-method called greet, we need a dispatch function and three methods. Let's call the dispatch function greet dispatch. It dispatches the animal type, either dog, cat, or cow. Then each dispatch value is handled by a specific method, dog by greet dog, cat by greet cat, and cow by greet cow. Theo takes out his notebook and opens it to a blank piece of paper. He draws a diagram like the one in figure 13.1. Dave, why is there an arrow between animal and the methods, in addition to the arrows between animal and the dispatch functions? Theo because the arguments of a multi-method are passed to the dispatch function and to the methods. 
Tip. The arguments of a multi-method are passed to the dispatch function and to the methods. Dave. Arguments, plural? I see only a single argument. Theo. You're right. Right now, our multi-method only receives a single argument, but soon it will receive several arguments. Dave. I see. Could you show me how to write the code for the greet multi-method? Theo. For that, we need a library. For instance, in JavaScript, the arrows slash multi-method library provides an implementation of multi-methods. Basically, we call multi to create a multi-method called method to add a method. Note. See this link for examples and documentation about this library. Dave, where should we start? Theo, we'll start with multi-method initialization by creating a dispatch function, greet dispatch, that defines the signature of the multi-method, validates the arguments, and emits the type of the animal. Then, we'll pass greet dispatch to multi in order to create the greet multi-method. Our dispatch function would then look like this. Tip. A multi-method dispatch function is responsible for three things. It defines the signature of the multi-method, it validates the arguments, and it emits a dispatch value. Dave, what's next? Theo, now we need to implement a method for each dispatched value. Let's start with the method that deals with dogs. We create a greet dog function that receives an animal and then add a dog method to the greet multi-method using the method function from the arrows slash multi-method library. The method function receives two arguments, the dispatched value and a function that corresponds to the dispatch value. Dave, does the method implementation have to be in the same module as the multi-method initialization? Theo, no, not at all. Method declarations are decoupled from multi-method initialization, exactly like class definitions are decoupled from the interface definition. That's what makes multi-methods extensible. Tip. Multi-methods provide extensibility by decoupling between multi-method initialization and multi-method implementations. Dave, what about cats and cows? Theo. We add their method implementations like we did for dogs. Theo takes a moment to envision the implementation. Then he codes up two more greet methods for cats and cows. Tip. In the context of multi-methods, a method is a function that provides an implementation for a dispatch value. Dave. Are the names of dispatch functions and methods important? Theo. According to what I read, not really, but I like to follow a simple naming convention. Use the name of the multi-method, for example, greet, as a prefix for the dispatch function, for example, greet dispatch, and the methods. Then I'd have the dispatch suffix for the dispatch function and a specific suffix for each method, for example, greet dog, greet cat, and greet cow. Dave, how does the multi-method mechanism work under the hood? Theo. Internally, a multi-method maintains a hash map where the keys are the dispatched values and the values are the methods. When we add a method, an entry is added to the hash map, and when we call the multi-method, we query the hash map to find the implementation that corresponds to the dispatched value. Dave, I don't think you've told me yet how to call a multi-method. Theo, we call it as a regular function. Give me a minute and I'll show you an example that calls a multi-method. Tip. Multi-methods are called like regular functions. Dave, you told me earlier that in the dispatch function we should validate the arguments. Is that mandatory or is it a best practice? Theo, it's a best practice. Dave, what happens if the dispatch function doesn't validate the arguments and we pass an invalid argument? Theo, like when an animal has no corresponding method? Dave, exactly. Theo, in that case, you'll get an error. For instance, the arrows slash multi-methods library throws a no method error exception. Dave, that's annoying. Is there a way to provide a default implementation? Theo, absolutely. In order to define a default implementation, you pass to method as a single argument, the function that provides the default implementation. 
Theo writes the code and shows it to Dave. Dave then tests Theo's code and seems satisfied with the result. Tip. Multi-methods support default implementations that are called when no method corresponds to the dispatch value. Dave. Cool. Section 13.3. Multi-methods with multiple dispatch. Theo. So far, we've mimicked OOP by having the type of the multi-method argument as a dispatch value. But if you think again about the flow of a multi-method, you'll discover something interesting. Would you like to try and draw a diagram that describes the flow of a multi-method in general? Dave, let me get a fresh napkin. The one under my glass is a bit wet. Theo, uh, Dave, you can use my notebook. It takes Dave a few minutes to draw a diagram like the one in figure 13.2. He pushes the notebook back to Theo. Theo, excellent. I hope you see that the dispatch function can emit any value. Dave, like what? Theo, like emitting the type of two arguments. Dave, what do you mean? Theo, imagine that our animals are polyglot. Dave, poly what? Theo, polyglot, comes from the Greek polis, meaning much, and from glossa, meaning language. A polyglot is a person who can speak many languages. Dave, what languages would our animals speak? Theo, I don't know. Let's say English and French. Dave, okay, and how would we represent a language in our program? Theo, with a map, of course. Dave, what fields would we have in a language map? Theo, let's keep things simple and have two fields, type and name. Dave, like an animal map? Theo, not exactly. In a language map, the type field must be either FR for French or EN for English, whereas in the animal map, the type field is either dog, cat, or cow. Dave, let me try to write the language map schema and the two language maps. Theo gladly consents. His French press coffee is getting cold. Dave writes his implementation of the code and shows Theo. Theo, excellent. Now let's write the code for the dispatch function and the methods for our polyglot animals. Let's call our multi-method greet lang. We have one dispatch function and six methods. Dave, right. Three animals, dog, cat, and cow, times two languages, en and fr. Before the implementation, I'd like to draw a flow diagram. It will help me to make things crystal clear. Theo, you need my notebook again? Not waiting for Dave to respond, Theo pushes his notebook across the table to Dave. Dave draws a diagram like the one in figure 13.3 and slides the notebook back to Theo. Theo, why did you omit the arrow between the arguments and the methods? Dave, in order to keep the diagram readable. Otherwise, there would be too many arrows. Theo. Okay, I see. Are you ready for coding? Dave. Yes. Theo. The dispatch function needs to validate its arguments and return an array with two elements, the type of animal and the type of language. Dave types for a bit on his laptop. He initializes the multi-method with a dispatch function that returns the type of its arguments and then shows the code to Theo. Dave. Does the order of the elements in the array matter? Theo. It doesn't matter, but it needs to be consistent with the wiring of the methods. The implementation of greet lang would therefore look like this. Dave looks at the code for the methods that deal with French. He is surprised to see O-U-A-F, O-U-A-F instead of woof woof for dogs, M-I-A-O-U instead of meow for cats, and M-E-U-H instead of moo for cows. I didn't know that animal onomatopoeia were different in French than in English. Theo, ono what? Dave, onomatopoeia. From the Greek onoma, that means name, and poeo, that means to produce. It is the property of words that sound like what they represent. For instance, woof, meow, and moo. Theo, yeah, for some reason, in French, dogs waf, cats miaou, and cows meu. Dave, 
I see that in the array the animal type is always before the language type. Theo, right. As I told you before, in a multi-method that features multiple dispatch, the order doesn't really matter, but it has to be consistent. Tip. Multiple dispatch is when a dispatch function emits a value that depends on more than one argument. In a multi-method that features multiple dispatch, the order of the elements in the array emitted by the dispatch function has to be consistent with the order of the elements in the wiring of the methods. Dave. Now let me see if I can figure out how to use a multi-method that features multiple dispatch. Dave remembers that Theo told him earlier that multi-methods are used like regular functions. With that in mind, he comes up with the code for a multi-method that features multiple dispatch. Theo. Now do you agree that multi-methods with multiple dispatch offer a more powerful polymorphism than OOP polymorphism? Dave. Indeed I do. Theo, let me show you an even more powerful polymorphism called dynamic dispatch. But first, let's get some more of that wonderful French press coffee. Dave, great idea. While we're in the kitchen, I think my mom made an orange bundt cake using the oranges from the grove. Section 13.4, Multimethods with Dynamic Dispatch. Dave refills their coffee cups as Theo takes two slices from the cake and dishes them up. They take their coffee and cake outside to enjoy more of the fresh country air before resuming their conversation. Dave, what is dynamic dispatch? Theo, it's when the dispatch function of a multi-method returns a value that goes beyond the static type of its arguments. Dave, like what, for example? Theo, like a number or a boolean, for instance. Dave, why would such a thing be useful? Theo, Imagine that, instead of being polyglot, our animals would suffer from dysmacrolexia. Dave, suffering from what? Theo, dysmacrolexia. It comes from the Greek deus, expressing the idea of difficulty, makres, meaning long, and lexis, meaning diction. Therefore, dysmacrolexia is difficulty pronouncing long words. Dave, I've never heard of that. Theo, that's because I just invented it. Dave, funny. What's considered a long word for our animals? Theo, let's say that when their name has more than five letters, they're not able to say it. Dave, a bit weird, but okay. Theo, let's call our multi-method discreet. This dispatch function returns an array with two elements, the animal type, and a boolean about whether the name is long or not. Take a look at this multi-method initialization. Dave, writing the discrete methods doesn't seem too complicated. As Theo reaches over to pass Dave his notebook, he accidentally hits his coffee cup. Now Theo's notebook is completely wet, and all the diagrams are soggy. Fortunately, Dave brought an extra napkin from the kitchen, and it's still clean. He draws a flow diagram, as in figure 13.4, and then grabs his laptop and writes the implementation of the discrete methods. Theo checks that the code works as expected. He compliments Dave, not only on the method implementation, but also for having the foresight to grab an extra napkin. Theo, well done, my friend. Our exploration of multi-methods has come to an end. I think it's time for me to drive back if I want to get home before dark and beat the rush hour traffic. Dave, before you leave, let's check if multi-methods are available in programming languages other than JavaScript. Theo. That's a question for Joe. Dave, do you think it's okay if I call him now? Theo, I think it's probably better if you send him an email. He's in a tech conference, and I'm not sure if it's all day. Thank you for this beautiful day in the country and the wonderful refreshments. Dave, I enjoyed it. Also, especially our discussions about etymology. I think there are some oranges for you to take home and enjoy later. Theo, great. I can't wait until my wife tries one. After Theo leaves, Dave sends Joe an email. A few minutes later, Dave receives an email from Joe with the subject, Support for Multimethods in Different Languages. Support for Multimethods in Different Languages. Python has a library called Multimethods at github.com slash weissjeffm slash multimethods. And Ruby has one called Ruby Multimethods at github.com slash 
P-S-A-N-T-A-C-L slash Ruby dash multimethods. Both seem to work quite like the JavaScript arrows slash multimethod library. In Java, there is the Java multimethod framework at igm.univ-mlv.fr slash tilde f-o-r-a-x slash works slash j-m-m-f and C-sharp supports multi-methods natively via the dynamic keyword. However, in both Java and C-sharp, multi-methods work only with static data types and not with generic data structures. Section 13.5, Integrating Multimethods in a Production System While Theo is driving back home, his thoughts take him back to the fresh air of the country. This pleasant moment is interrupted by a phone call from Nancy at Clapham. Nancy, how are you doing? Theo, fine, I'm driving back from the countryside. Nancy, cool, are you available to talk about work? Theo, sure. Nancy, I'd like to add a tiny feature to the catalog. In the past, when Nancy qualified a feature as tiny, it scared Theo, because tiny turned into huge. What seemed easy to her always took him a surprising amount of time to develop. But after refactoring the system according to DOP principles, now what seems tiny to Nancy is usually quite easy to implement. Theo, what feature? Nancy, I'd like to allow librarians to view the list of authors ordered by last name in two formats, HTML and Markdown. Theo, it doesn't sound too complicated. Nancy, also, I need a bit of text formatting. Theo, what kind of text formatting? Nancy, depending on the number of books an author has written, their name should be in bold and italic fonts. Theo, could you send me an email with all the details? I'll take a look at it tomorrow morning. Nancy, perfect. Have a safe drive. Before going to bed, Theo reflects about today's etymology lessons. He realizes that he never looked for the etymology of the word etymology itself. He searches for the term etymology online and learns that the word etymology derives from the Greek etymon, meaning true sense, and the suffix logia, denoting the study of. During the night, Theo dreams of dogs, cats, and cows programming on their laptops in a field of grass. When Theo arrives at the office the next day, he opens Nancy's email with the details about the text formatting feature. The details are summarized in Table 13.1. Theo forwards Nancy's email to Dave and asks him to take care of this task. Delegating responsibility, after all, is the trait of a great manager. Dave thinks the most difficult part of the feature lies in implementing an author.myName, author format, function that receives two arguments, the author data and the text format. He asks himself whether he can implement this function as a multi-method and use what he learned yesterday with Theo at his parents' home in the country. It seems that this feature is quite similar to the one that dealt with dysmacrolexia. Instead of checking the length of a string, he needs to check the length of an array. First, Dave needs a data schema for the text format. He could represent a format as a map with a type field like Theo did yesterday for languages, but at the moment it seems simpler to represent a format as a string that could be either Markdown or HTML. He comes up with the text format schema in listing 13.21. He already wrote the author schema with Theo last week. It's in listing 13.22. Now, Dave needs to write a dispatch function and initialize the multi-method. Remembering that Theo had no qualms about creating the word dysmacrolexia, he decides that he prefers his own neologism prolificity over the existing nominal form prolificness. He finds it useful to have an author.prolificity level helper function that returns the level of prolificity of the author, either low, medium, or high. Now he's ready to code the author name dispatch function. Then Dave works on the methods. First, the HTML format methods. In HTML, bold text is wrapped inside a B tag, and italic text is wrapped in a I tag. For instance, in HTML, three authors with different levels of prolificity would be written like this. With this information in hand, 
Dave writes the three methods that deal with HTML formatting. Easy. Then, Dave moves on to the three methods that deal with markdown formatting. In markdown, bold text is wrapped in two asterisks, and italic text is wrapped in a single asterisk. For instance, in markdown, three authors with different levels of prolificity would be written like the code in listing 13.26. The code for the markdown methods is in listing 13.27. Dave decides to test his code by involving a mysterious author. Listing 13.28 and listing 13.29 show the tests. Theo shows up at Dave's desk and asks to review Dave's implementation of the list of authors feature. Curious, Theo asks Dave about the author that appears in the test of author.myName. Theo. Who is Johanathan Charvet? Dave, I don't really know. The name appeared when I googled data-oriented programming yesterday. He wrote a book on the topic. I thought it would be cool to use its ISBN in my test. Summary The main benefit of polymorphism is extensibility. Multimethods make it possible to benefit from polymorphism when data is represented with generic maps. A multi-method is made of a dispatch function and multiple methods. The dispatch function of a multi-method emits a dispatch value. Each of the methods used in a multi-method provides an implementation for a specific dispatch value. Multi-methods can mimic OOP class inheritance via single dispatch. In single dispatch, a multi-method receives a single map that contains a type field and the dispatch function of the multi-method emits the value of the type field. In addition to single dispatch, multi-methods provide two kinds of advanced polymorphisms, multiple dispatch and dynamic dispatch. Multiple dispatch is used when the behavior of the multi-method depends on multiple arguments. Dynamic dispatch is used when the behavior of the multi-method depends on runtime arguments. The arguments of a multi-method are passed to the dispatch function and to the methods. A multi-method dispatch function is responsible for defining the signature, validating the arguments, emitting a dispatch value. Multi-methods provides extensibility by decoupling between multi-method initialization and method implementations. Multi-methods are called like regular functions. Multi-methods support default implementations that are called when no method corresponds to the dispatch value. In a multi-method that features multiple dispatch, the order of the elements in the array emitted by the dispatch function has to be consistent with the order of the elements in the wiring of the methods.